Chapter Twenty Four of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Doctor Seward's phonograph diary, spoken by Van Helsing. This to Jonathan Harker. You are to stay with your dear Madame Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so, for it is not a search but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that so you will know what we four know already, for I have tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He had gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have prepared for this in some way. The last earth box was already to ship somewheres. For this he took the money. For this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope save that he might hide in the tomb that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. When that fail, he makes straight for his last resource. His last earthwork, I might say, did I wish double on Tonte. He is clever, oh so clever. He know that his game here was finished, and so he decided to go back home. He find ship, going the route he came in and got in it. We go off now to find what ship and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor dear Madam Mina with new hope. For it will be hope when you think it over, that all is not lost. This very creature that we pursue, he take hundreds of years to get so far as London. And yet in one day, when we know of the disposal of him, we drive him out. He is finite, though he is powerful to do much harm, and suffers not as we do. But we are strong, each in our purpose, and we are all more strong together. Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win. So sure that as God sits on high to watch over his children, Therefore, be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsen Jonathan Harker's Journal, 4th of October When I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. Already as the certainty that the Count was out of the country has given her comfort, and comfort is strength to her. Now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long forgotten dream. Here in the crisp autumn air and the bright sunlight, alas, how can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought, my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. While that lasts, there can be no disbelief. And afterwards, the very memory of it will keep faith crystal clear. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been over all the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seems greater each time, the pain and the fear seem less. There's something of a guiding purpose manifests throughout, which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be, I shall try to think as she does, we have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the Professor and the others after their investigation. The day is running by more quickly than I ever thought a day could run for me again. It's now three o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal, 5th of October, 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present, Professor Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. 
as I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth, or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us, omne ignotum pro magnifico, and if so, with heavy hearts, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. It was in a sailing ship, since Madame Mina tells of sails being set. These are not so important as to go in the, your list of the shipping in the Times. And so we go, by suggestion of Lord Godalming, to your Lloyd's, where there are note of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one Black Sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she will sail from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna and thence to the other parts up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship whereupon is the Count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office of wood so small that the man looked bigger than the office. From him we inquire of the goings of the Tsarina Catherine. He swear much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. And when Quincy give him something from his pocket, which crackle as he roll it up and put it in a so small bag, which he have hid deep in his clothing, he better fellow and humble servant to us. He come with us and ask many men who are rough and hot. These be better fellows too when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood and bloom and of others which I comprehend not, though I guess what they mean, but nevertheless they tell us all the things we want to know. They make it known to us among them how last afternoon at about five o'clock comes a man so hurry, a tall man, thin and pale, with a high nose, and teeth so white, and eyes that seem to be burning, that he be all in black, except they have a hack of straw, which suit him not all the time, that he scatter his money in making quick inquiry as to what ship sail for the Black Sea, and for where. Some took him to the office, and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore end of gangplank, and ask whether the captain come to him. The captain come, when told that he will pay well, and though he swear much, at the first he agree to turn. Then the thin man go and someone tell him where the horse and cart can be hired. He go there and soon he come again, himself driving cart on which a great box, which he lifted himself down, though it take several, put it on truck for the ship. Gave much talk to captain as to how and where his box is to be placed. But the captain like it not, and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like he can come and see where it shall be. But he say no, that he come not yet, or that he have much to do. Whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick with blood, or this ship will leave the place of blood before the turn of the tide with blood. And the thin man smile and say that of course he must go when he think fit. He will be surprised if he go quite soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the thin man make him bow and thank him and say that he will be so far intrude on his kindness as to come aboard before the sailing. Final, the captain more red than ever, tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchman, and also after asking where they might be close at hand, a ship where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went, or blooming well cared, as they said, for he had something else to think of. Well with blood again, for it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship, and all around her, the captain swore polygot, very polygot, polygot, with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood, when just at full tide the thin man came up the gangplate again, 
and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished that he, he and his box, old and with much bloom and blood, were in hell. But the thin man did not be offended, and went down with the mate and saw where it was placed, and came up and stood a while on deck in a fog. He must have come off by himself, for none noticed him. Indeed, they thought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst, and the language that was of bloom and blood, laughed as they told how the captain swears exceeded even his usual polygot, and was more than ever full of picturesque. When on questioning other mariners who were on movement up and down the river that hour, he found that a few of them had seen any fog at all, except where it lay around the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide, and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was by then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so, my dear Madam Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea, with a fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. The ship takes time to go, she never so quick, and when we start we go on land, more quick than we meet him there. Our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset, for then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan, for we all know about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship, who have shown us the invoices and all the papers you can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna, and to be given to an agent, one Ristix, who will there present his credentials, and so our merchant friend will have done his part. When he asks if there be any wrong, for that so he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna, we say no, for what is to be done is not for police or of the customs. It must be done by us, alone and in our own way. When Dr. Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he was certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, we have the best proof of that, your own evidence within the hypnotic trance this morning. I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count, for oh, I dread Jonathan leaving me, and I know that he would surely go if the others went. He answered in growing passion, at first quietly, as he went on, however, he grew more angry and more forceful, till in the end we could not but see wherein was the least sum of the personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. Yes, it is necessary, 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 for your sake in the first, and then for the sake of humanity. That monster has done much harm already, in the narrow scope where he finds himself, and in the short time when as yet he is only a body, groping his so small measure in darkness, and not knowing all this have I told these others, you, my dear Madam Mina, will learn it in the phonograph of my friend John, or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of his leaving his own barren land, barren of peoples, coming to a new land where a life of man seems to they are like a multitude of standing corn, was the work of centuries. Were another of the undead like him try to do what he has done, perhaps not in all the countries of the world that have they been, or that will could aid him. For this one, all the forces of nature are occult and deep, and strong, must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place where he have been alive, undead for all these centuries, is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none know whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whose openings still send out waters of strange properties, and gases that kill or to make to vivify. Doubtless there is something magnetic or electric in some of these combinations of occult forces which work for physical life in a strange way, and in himself were from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time he was celebrated that he had more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart than any man. 
in him some vital principle have in a strange way found their utmost and as his body keep strong and grow and thrive so his brain grow too all this without that diabolic aid which is surely to him for it have to yield to the powers that come from and are symbolic of good and now this is what he is to us he have infect you oh forgive me my dear that i must say such but it is for good of you that i speak he infect you in such wise and that even if he do not no more you have only to live to live in your own old sweet way and so in time death which is of a man's common lot and with god's sanction shall make you like to him this must not be we have sworn together that it must not thus are we ministers of god's own wish that the world and men for whom his son die will not be given over to monsters whose very existence would defame him he have allowed us to redeem one soul already and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more like them we shall travel towards the sunrise and like them if we fail we fail in a good cause he paused and i said but will not the count take his rebuff wisely since he has been driven from england will he not avoid it as far as the tiger does the village from which it has been hunted aha uh -huh, he said your simile of the tiger is good for me and i shall adopt him your man eater as they say in india or call the tiger who has once tasted the blood of a human care no more for the other prey but prowl unceasing till he get him this is what we hunt from our village is a tiger too a man-eater and he has never ceased to prowl and in himself he is not one to retire and stay afar in his life in his living he go over the turkey frontier and attack his enemy on his own ground he be beaten back but did he stay no he come again and again and again look at his persistence and endurance child brain that was to him he have long since conceived the idea of coming to a great city what does he do he find out the place of all the world's most promise for him then he deliberately set himself down to prepare the task he find in patience just how his strength and what are his powers he study new tongues he learn new social life new environment of old ways the politic the law the finance the science the habit of a new land and a new people to have come to be since he was his glimpse that he have had whet his appetite only and in keen his desire for it all proved to him how right he was at the first of his surmises he have done this alone all alone from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land what more may he not do when the greater world of thought is open to him he that can smile at death as we know him who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kill off whole peoples oh if such a one was to come from god and not the devil what a force for good might he not be in this old world of ours but we are pledged to set the world free our toil must be in silence our efforts all in secret for in this enlightened age where men believe not even what they see the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength it would be at once his sheath and his armor and his weapons to destroy us his enemies who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love for the good of mankind and for the honor and glory of god after a general discussion it was determined that for tonight nothing be definitely settled that we should all sleep on the facts and try to think out the proper conclusions tomorrow at breakfast we are to meet again and after making our conclusions known to one another we shall decide on some definite cause of action i feel a wonderful peace and rest tonight it is as if some haunting presence were removed from me perhaps my surmise was not finished could not be for i caught sight in the mirror of the red mark upon my forehead and i knew that i was still unclean Dr. Seward's diary, 5th of October. We all rose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. 
when we met at early breakfast there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had ever expected to experience again it is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature let any obstructing cause no matter what be removed in any way even by death and we fly back to first principles of hope and enjoyment more than once as we sat around the table my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream it was only when i caught sight of the red blotch on mrs harker's forehead that i was brought back to reality even now when i am gravely revolving the matter it is almost impossible to realize that the course of all our trouble is still existent even mrs harker seems to have lost sight of her trouble for whole spells it is only now and again when something recalls it to her mind as she thinks of her terrible scar we are to meet here in my study in half an hour and decide on our course of action i see only one immediate difficulty i know it by instinct rather than reason we shall have to speak frankly if i fear that in some mysterious way poor mrs harker's tongue is tied i know that she forms conclusions of her own and from all that has been I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be, but she will not or cannot give them utterance. I've mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I are to talk it over when we are alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison which has got into her veins beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age where the existence of tomains is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I know, even if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, then there is a terrible difficulty, an unknown danger in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further. For so I should in my thoughts dishonour a noble woman. Van Helsing is coming to my study little before the others. I shall try and open the subject with him. Later. When the Professor came in we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy about broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little he said suddenly, Friend John, there is something that you and I must talk of alone. Just at the first, at any rate. Later, we may have to take the others into our confidence. Then he stopped, so I waited. He went on. Madam Mina, our poor dear Madam Mina, is changing. A cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed. Van Helsing continued. With the sad experience of Miss Lucy, we must this time be warned before things go too far. Our task is now in reality more difficult than ever, and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance. I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming into her face. It is now but very, very slight, but it is to be seen if we have eyes to notice without to prejudge. The teeth of some sharper, at times her eyes are more hard. But these are not all. There is to her the silence now often. And so it was with Miss Lucy. She did not speak, even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later. Now my fear is this. If it be that she can, by our hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear, it is not more true that he who hath hypnotised her first and who have drink of her very blood, and make her drink of his, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know. I nodded acquiescence. He went on. Then what we must do to prevent this, we must keep her ignorant of our intent, so that she cannot tell what she know not. This is a painful task. Oh, so painful that it heartbreak me to think of. But it must be done. When today we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not to speak, 
she must not be of our council, but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead, which had broken out in profuse perspiration, with the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I also had come to the same conclusion, or at any rate it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering. Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later, at the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. The Professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. For my own part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realised the danger of herself, it was much pain as well as much danger averted. Under the circumstances we agreed, by a questioning look and answer with finger on lip, to preserve the silence in our suspicions until we should have been able to confer alone again. We went at once into our plan of campaign. Van Helsing roughly put the facts before us first. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her at the quickest speed she has ever made at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel overland to the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage, owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count can bring to bear, and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on the 17th at the latest, when we shall at any rate be in Varna the day before the ship arrives, and be able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall all go armed, armed against evil things, spiritual as well as physical. Here, Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I kind of belief in a Winchester, when there's any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us at Toblosk? What we wouldn't have given for a repeater apiece. Good, said Van Housie. Winchesters it shall be. Quincy's head is level at all times, but most so when there is to hunt. Metaphor be more dishonour to science than wolves be of danger to man. In the meantime, we can do nothing here, and I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us. Why not go there more soon? It's as long to wait here as it is there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker, interrogatively, looking from one to the other of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly. You must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Harker was silent for a while and said in a hollow voice, Let us talk of that part of it in the morning. I want to consult with Mila. I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him not to disclose our plans to her. But he took no notice. I looked at him significantly and coughed. For answer, he put his finger on his lips and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 5th of October, afternoon. For some time after our meeting, this morning I could not think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take part in the discussion set me thinking, and as I could not argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far as ever from a solution now. The way the others received it too puzzled me. The last time we talked to the subject, we agreed there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now calmly and sweetly like a little child. Her lips are curved and her face beams with happiness. 
Thank God there are such moments still for her. Later, how strange it all is. I sat watching Mina's happy sleep and came as near to being happy as myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on and the earth took its shadows from the sun, sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once Mina opened her eyes and, looking at me tenderly, said, Jonathan, I want you to promise me something on your word of honour. Promise made to me, but made wholly in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once. Mina, I said, a promise like that I cannot make at once, and may have no right to make it. But, dear one, she said, with such spiritual intensity that her eyes were like pole stars, if it is I who wish it, and it is not for myself, you can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I am not right. If he disagrees, you may do as you will. Nay more, if you all agree later, you are absolved from the promise. I promise, I said. For a moment she looked supremely happy, though to me all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. She said, promise me that you will not tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, not by word or inference or implication, not at any time whilst this remains to me. And she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest and said solemnly, I promise. And as I said it, I felt that from that instant a door had been shut between us. Later, midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening. So much so that all the rest seem to take courage, as if infected somewhat with her gaiety. As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down was somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It is a wonderful thing that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for at least she can forget her cares. Perhaps her example may affect me as her gaiety did tonight. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep. 6th of October, morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early about the same time as yesterday and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that this was another occasion for hypnotism and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come too. No, she said quite simply. It will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause, he asked, But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you, and you shall be safer too. Why, dear Madam Mina, you know that your safety is our solemnest duty. We go into danger to which you are, or may be, more liable than any of us, from circumstances, things that have been, he paused, embarrassed. As she replied, she raised her finger and pointed to her forehead. I know, that is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come in secret, I must come by wile, or by any device to hoodwink even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned upon me as she spoke. And if there be indeed a recording angel, that look is noted in her everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers. For you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotise me and so learn that which even myself I do not know. Van Helsing said very gravely, Madam Mina, you are, as always, most wise. 
You shall with us come, and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on her pillow asleep. She did not even wake when I pulled the blind up and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned to me to come with him quietly. We went into his room, and within a minute, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said and went on. In the morning, we shall leave for Varna. We now have to deal with a new factor, Madame Mina, but oh, her soul is true. It is to her an agony to tell us so much as she has done, but it is most right and we are warned in time. There must be no chance lost, and in Varna we must be ready to act the instant when the ship arrives. What shall we do exactly? asked Mr. Morris laconically. The Professor paused before replying. We shall be at the first board of that ship. Then, when we have identified the box, we shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten, for when it is there, none can emerge, so at least says the superstition. And to superstition we must trust at first. As man's faith in the early and have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunity that we seek, when none are near to see, we shall open the box and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it and destroy the monster, though there were a thousand men looking on, and if I am to be wiped out for it in the next moment. I grasped his hand instinctively and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. Good boy, said Dr. Van Helsing. Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, none of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear. I do but say that we may do what we must do. But indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we shall do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various, and until that moment we may not say. We shall all be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our efforts shall not be lacked. Now let us today put all our affairs in order. Let all things which touch on others dear to us, and who on us depend, be complete. For none of us can tell what or when or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate. And as I have nothing else to do, I shall go and make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all the tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we all parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth and be ready for whatever may come. Later, it is all done. My will is made and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have the remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which however may be in God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now. But if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She is calling to me. End of chapter 24chapter 25 of Dracula by Bram Stoker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter 25 Dr Seward's diary 11th of October evening Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says that he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are to her times of peculiar freedom. 
when her old self can be manifest without any controlling force, subduing or restraining her, or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half an hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset, and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays streaming above the horizons. At first there is sort of a negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. When, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly, preceded only by a spell of warning silence. Tonight when we met, she was somewhat constrained and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself, then motioning to her husband to sit beside her on the sofa where she was half reclining. She made the rest of us bring chairs up close, and taking her husband's hand in hers, began. We are all here together for freedom, or perhaps the last time. I know, dear, I know that you will always be with me to the end. This was to her husband, whose hand, as we could see, tightened upon hers. In the morning we go out upon our task, and God alone knows what may be in store for any of us. You're going to be so good to me as to take me with you. I know that all brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman, whose soul, perhaps, is lost. No, no, not yet, but at any rate at stake. You will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake. And though I know that there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. What is that way? asked Van Helsing in a hoarse voice. What is that way which we must not, may not take? Though I may die now, either by my own hand or that of another, for the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know, and you know, that more once I were dead, you could and would set free my immortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's. Were death, or the fear of death, the only thing that stood in the way, I would not shrink to die here, now, amongst the friends who love me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case, when there is hope before us, and a bitter task to be done. It's God's will. Therefore I, on my part, give up here the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark, where may be the blackest things that the world or the nether world holds. We were all silent, for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were set, and Harker's grew ashen grey. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us, what was coming. She continued. This is what I can give into the hotchpot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place, and with all seriousness. What will each of you give? Your lives, I know, she went on quickly. That is easy for brave men. Your lives are God's and you can give them back to him. But what will you give to me? She looked again questioningly this time avoided her husband's face. Quincy seemed to understand. He nodded and her face lit up. And I shall tell you plainly what I want, but there must be no doubtful matter in this connection between us now. You must promise me one and all, even you, my beloved husband, that should the time come, you will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's, but it was low and strained. When you shall be convinced that I am changed, that it is better that I die than I may live. When I am thus dead in the flesh, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head, or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. He knelt up before her, 
and taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow who hasn't perhaps lived as a man should to win such a distinction. But I swear to you by all that I hold sacred and dear that should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. And I promise you too that I shall make all certain for I am only doubtful I shall take it that the time has come. And I promise you too that I shall make all certain for if I am only doubtful I shall take it that the time has come. My true friend was all she could say amid her fast falling tears, as bending over she kissed his hand. I swear the same, my dear Madam Mina, said Van Helsing, and I, said Lord Godalming, each of them in turn, kneeling to her to take the oath. I followed myself. Then her husband turned to her, one-eyed and with a greenish pallor, which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair, and asked, And again, must I too make such a promise, O oh, my wife? You too, my dearest, she said, with infinite yearning of pity in her voice and eyes. You must not shrink. You are the nearest and dearest in all the world to me. But our souls are knit into one. For all life and all time. Think, dear, there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womenkind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any the more because of those that they love implored them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those whom they love in such times of sore trial. And oh dear, if it must be that I meet my death at any hand, let it be at the hand that loves me best. Dr. Van Helsing, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush and changed her phrase. To him who had the best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again I swear, came the professor's resonant voice. Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled, as with a sigh of relief she leant back and said, And now one word of warning, a warning which you must never forget. This time, if it ever comes, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time I myself might be, nay, if the time ever comes, shall be, leagued with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart and continued, you must read it over me some day. Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be a sweet thought to all, to all some of us. You, my dearest, will, I hope, read it. Or well, then it will be in your voice, in my memory, forever, come what may. Oh, but oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is far off from me. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand, I am deeper in death at this moment and if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavily upon me. Ah, oh, my wife, must I read it, he said before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said. And he began to read when she got the book ready. How could anyone tell of that strange scene? Its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and with all its sweetness. Even a sceptic who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady or heard the tender passion of a husband's voice as in tones so broken with emotion that often he had to pause. He read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. 
I, I cannot go on. Words and voice fail me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it all was, bizarre as it may hereafter seem even to us, who felt its potential influence at the time, it comforted us much, and the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from the freedom of soul did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15th of October, Varna We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to the hotel, the Odessus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God Mina is well and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes, but now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments to simply will and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, nothing, all is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain, and masts and yards creak. The wind is high, I can hear it, in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that the Tsarina Katharina is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Katharina had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if it were not reported, so that he might be sure there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. Tomorrow we are to see the Vice Consul and to arrange if we can about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance would be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own violation, and so cannot leave the ship, as he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid. He must remain in the box. If then we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God. This is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are all well supplied with money. We have only to make sure the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise, without our being warned, and we should be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16th of October. Mina's report is still the same. Lapping waves, rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready, as she must pass the Dardanelles we are sure to have some report. 17th of October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent aboard 
might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorisation to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent, who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The Professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case there would be no evidence against us, in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully, if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24th of October, a whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story, not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water and creaking masts. Telegram, October the 24th. Rufus Smith, Lloyd's London. To Lord Godalming, care of HBM, Vice Consul, Varna. Tsarina Catherine reported this morning from the Dardanelles. Dr Seward's diary. The 25th of October. How oh, I miss my phonograph. Write a diary with a pen is irksome to me. But Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs Harker, alone in our party, did not show any signs of emotion. But after all, is it not strange that she did not? For we took special care not to let her know anything about it and we all tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In old days, she would, I am sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it. But in this way, she has greatly changed during the last three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her. Although she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart. Certainly his nerve, if he knew there was even a suspicion on the subject. When Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully while she's in the hypnotic condition. For he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about 24 hours sail from the Dardanelles to here. At the rate the Tsarina Catherine has come from London, she should arrive sometime in the morning. Though she cannot possibly get in before then, we are all about to retire early. We should get up at one o'clock so as to be ready. 25th of October, noon. No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs Harker's hypnotic report this morning is the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker who is calm. His hands are cold as ice. And an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gurkha knife which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that cookery 
ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon she got into a sort of lethargy, which we did not like. Although we kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all the morning, so that we were all at first glad to know she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went into her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally and looked so well and peaceful that we all agreed that sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl, she has so much to forget. It is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later. Our opinion was justified. When, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up. She seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset, she made the usual hypnotic report. That wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26th of October. Another day and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent. For Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It is possible that the vessel may be lying by. At times, for fog, some of the steamers, which came in last evening, reported patches of fog both to the north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled at any moment. 27th of October, noon. Most strange. No news yet of the ship. We wait, for Mrs. Harker reported last night, and this morning as usual, lapping waves and rushing water. Well, she added that the waves were very faint. Telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious, and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I do not like that lethargy of Madame Mina's. Souls and memories can do strange things during the trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28th of October. Telegram, Rufus Smith, London, to Lord Godalming. Care of HBM Vice Consul Varna. The Tsarina Katharina reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today, 28th of October, when the telegram came announcing the arrival to Galatz. I don't think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we did not know when, or how, or when the bolt would come. I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The delay of the arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not just be as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however, it was it a surprise. I suppose that the nature of work on such a hopeful basis that we believed against ourselves that things would be as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angel even if it be a will-o'-the-wisp to the man. It was an odd experience, and we all took it differently. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment, as though in remonstrance with the Almighty, but he said not a word, and for a few seconds stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half stunned and looked in wonder one after another, Quincy Morris tightened his belt with a quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days it meant action. Mrs Harker grew ghastly white so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn. She folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope. But at the same time his action belied his words for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great cookery knife, and rested there. When does the next train start for Galat? said Van Helsing to us generally. 
at 6.30 tomorrow morning. We all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Arger. How on earth do you know, said Art? You forget, or perhaps do not know, though Jonathan does, and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am the train fiend. I always used to make up the timetables, so as to be helpful to my husband. I found it so useful sometimes, that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest. So I learned the times very carefully, and happily there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow leaves as I say. Wonderful woman, muttered the Professor. Can we get a special? asked Lord Godalming, and Helsing shook his head. I fear not. The land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now let us organise. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets and arrange it all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in Galatz with authority to make search the ship just as it was here. Morris Quincy, you see the vice consul and get his aid with his fellow in Galatz, and all he can do to make our way smooth, so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John will stay with Madame Mina and me, and we shall consult. For so, if time be long, you may be delayed, and it will not matter when the sun sets, since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker brightly, and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and I shall think and write for you as I used to do. Something is shifting from me in some strange way. I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment, as they seemed to realise the significance of her words. But Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met each a grave and troubled glance. We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, We mean the same, speak out. There is some change. It is a hope that makes me sick or it may deceive us. Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript? No, said I, unless it was to get an opportunity to be alone. You are in part right, friend John, but only in part. I want to tell you something. I know my friend I am taking a great, terrible risk, but I believe it is right. The moment when Madame Mina said those words had arrested us both our understanding, an inspiration came to me in the trance of three days ago. The Count sent her his spirit to read her mind, and more like he took her to see him in his earth box, in the ship of the water rushing. Just as it go free at rise in the set of sun, he learned then that we are here, for she had more to tell in her open life with eyes to see and ears to hear than he, shut as he is in his own, shut as he is in his coffin box. Now he make his most effort to escape us. At present he want her not. He is sure, with his so great knowledge, that she will come at his call. But he cut her off, take her as he can do, out of his own power, so that she should not come to him. Ah, there I have a hope that our man brains have been a man so long and have not lost the grace of God, will come higher than his child brain. That lie in his tomb for centuries, that grow not yet to our stature, and that do only work selfish, and therefore small. Here comes Madame Mina, not a word to her of her trance. She know it not, and it would overwhelm her, and make despair just when we want all her hope, all her courage. When most we want all her great brain, which is trained like a man's brain. 
but is of sweet woman and have special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he think not so. Hush, let me speak and you shall learn. Oh, John, my friend, we are in an awful strait. I fear as I never feared before. We can only trust the good God. Silence, here she comes. I thought that the Professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died. But with a great effort, he controlled himself and was at perfect nervous poise when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy looking, and in the doing of work seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked them over gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his fingers and thumb, he said, Friend John, to you with so much of an experience already, and you too, dear Madam Mina, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him loose his wings. Here, now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought came from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, but a whole thought, not so young that he is not yet strong, to use little wings, nay, the ugly duck of my friend Hans Anderson, he be no duck-thought at all, but a big swan-thought, that sail nobly on big wings, when the time come for him to try them. See, I read here what Jonathan have written. That other of his race, who in a later age, again and again, brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much? No. Count's child thought see nothing. Therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing. My man thought see nothing. Till just now. No, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought. Because she too know not what it mean. What it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest Yet when, in nature's course, they move on their way, and they touch, then poof, and there comes a flash of light, heaven-wide, that blind and kill and destroy some. But that show up all earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin, have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John, yes, for a study of insanity. You know, Madam Mina. For crime touch you not, but once. Still, your mind works true, and argues not a particularly ad universally. There is this peculiarity in criminals. It is so constant in all countries and at all times, that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically. That is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime. That is the true criminal who seems to predestinate to crime and who will of none other. This criminal has not a full man brain. He is clever, cunning and resourceful. But he be not of a man stature as to brain. He be of a child brain in much. Now this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child brain and is of the child brain to do what he have done. The little bird, the little fish, the little animal learn not by principle, but empirically, and when he learn to do, there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Dos posto, said Archimedes, give me a fulcrum and I shall move the world. To do once is a fulcrum, whereby a child brain become a man brain. And until he have the purpose to do more, he continue to do the same again every time, just as he have done before. Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are open, and that to you the lightning flash show all the league. 
for mrs harker began to clap her hands and her eyes sparkled he went on now you shall speak tell us two dry men of science what you see with those oh so bright eyes he took her hand and held it while she spoke his finger and thumb close on her pulse as i thought instinctively and unconsciously as she spoke the count is a criminal and of a criminal type nordo and lombroso would so classify him and qua criminal he is of imperfectly formed mind thus in a difficulty he has to seek resources in habit his past is a clue and the one page of it that we know and that from his own lips tells that once when in what mr morris would call a tight place he went back to his own country from the land he had tried to invade and thence without losing purpose prepared himself for a new effort so he came again better equipped for his work and won so he came to london to invade a new land he was beaten and when all hope of success was lost and his existence in danger he fled back over the sea to his home just as he formerly had fled back over the danube from turkey land good good oh you so clever lady said van helsing enthusiastically as he stooped and kissed her hand a moment later he said to me as calmly as though he'd been having a sick room consultation seventy-two only and in all this excitement i have hope turning to her again he said with keen expectation but go on go on there is more to tell if you will be not afraid john and i know i do in any case and shall tell you if you are right speak without fear i will try to but you will forgive me if i seem egotistical nay fear not you must be an egotist for it is of you that we think then as he is a criminal he is selfish and his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness he confines himself to one purpose that purpose is remorseless as he fled back over the danube leaving his forces to be cut to pieces so now he is intent on being safe careless of all so his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night i felt it oh i felt it thank god for his great mercy my soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends the professor stood up he has so used your mind and by it he has left us here in varna whilst the ship that carried him rushed through the enveloping fog up to galatz where doubtless he had made preparation for escaping from us but his child mind only saw so far and it may be that as ever it is in god's providence the very thing that the evil doer most reckoned on for his selfish good turns out to be his chiefest harm the hunter is taken in his own snare as the great psalmist says for now that he think he is free from every trace of us and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him and his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep he think too that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind there can be no knowledge of him to you that is where he fail that terrible baptism of blood which he gave you makes you free to go to him in spirit as you have yet done in your times of freedom when the sun rise and set at such times you go by my violation and not by his and this power to good of you and others as you have won from your suffering at his hands this is now all the more precious that he know it not and to guard himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where we however are not selfish and we believe that god is with us through all this blackness and these mark many dark hours we shall follow him and we shall not flinch even if we peril ourselves that we become like him friend john this has been a great hour and it have done much to advance us on our way you must scribe and write him all down so when the others return to their work you can give it to them and they should know as we do and so i have written it 
whilst we wait their return. And Mrs. Harker has written with her typewriter all since she brought the MS to us. End of chapter 25Chapter 26 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 Dr. Seward's Diary. 29th of October. This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could. So far as thought and endeavour and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey and our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Mrs Harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of Van Helsing than has been usually necessary, she sank late into the trance. Usually she speaks on a hint, but this time the professor had to ask her questions before we could learn anything. At last her answer came. I can see nothing. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the hawser. I can hear men's voices calling near and far and the roll and creak of oars in the rollocks. A gun is fired somewhere. The echo of it seems far away. There is a tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What is this? There's a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen as if impulsively from where she lay on the sofa, and raised both her hands, palms upwards, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed round the hilt of his cookery. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time had come when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and as she opened her eyes and said sweetly, would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired. We could only make her happy and so acquiesce. She bustled off to get tea. When she had gone, Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he is yet to get on shore. In the night, he may lie hidden somewhere. But if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship does not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such a case he can, if it be in the night, change his form and can jump or fly on shore as he did at Whitby. But if the day come before he gets on shore, then unless he be carried, he cannot escape. And if he be carried, then the customs men may discover what the box contains. Thus in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight, or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, or if he escape not, at night we shall come on him, in daytime, boxed, and at our mercy, for he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said, so we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might have learnt more from Mrs Harker. Early this morning we listened with breathless anxiety for a response in her trance. The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. At last, in obedience to his will, she made a reply. All is dark. I hear lapping water level with me and some creaking, as of wood on wood. She paused and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight.
And so it is that we are travelling towards Galatz in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning. But already at Bucharest we are three hours late. So we cannot possibly get in till well after summer. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs Harker. Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later. Sunset has come and gone. Fortunately it came at a time when there was no distraction. For had it occurred whilst we were at station, we might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Mrs Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations may die away, just when we want it the most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. While she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge. It would be a happy thought, but I'm afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something is going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear far off confused sounds as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water and the howling of wolves. She stopped and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds. Till at the end, she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the Professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She could not remember anything but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time and in silence. 30th of October, 7am. We are near Galatz now, and I may have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all, knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance. Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time when she yielded with a still greater difficulty only a minute before the sun rose. The Professor lost no time in questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swirling by, level with my ears and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle low, far off. There is another sound, a queer one, like... She stopped and grew white and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing, in an agonised voice. At the same time, there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Mrs Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes and we all started, as she said sweetly, and seemingly with the utmost unconcern. Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. And then seeing the look of amazement on her faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing. Only that I was lying here, half asleep, and heard you say, Go on. Speak, I command you. It seems so funny to hear you order me about, as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madame Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honour you, when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange because it is to order her whom I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding, we are nearing Galatz. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of October. Mr. Morris took me to the hotel where our rooms had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, 
since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the Vice Consul, as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official. We being in extreme hurry, Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn the particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later, Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away and the vice consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk, and he was very obliging and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's journal, 30th of October. At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward and I called on Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkopf the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraph request, asking us to show them any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous. They took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage, he said that in all his life he had, had never had so favourable a run. Man, he said, but it made us a fear, for we expected that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of ill luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run for London to the Black Sea with a wind against ye, and although the devil himself were a-blowing on your sail for his own purposes, at another time we could not spear a thing. Gin we were nigh a ship or a port or a headland, a fog fell on us and travelled with us till when after that had lifted we looked out. The devil a thing could we see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal until we came to the Dardanelles and had to wait to get our permit to pass. We were never within hail of aught. At first, I'm inclined to slack off sail and beat about till the fog was lifted. But whilst I thought that the devil was minded to get us into the Black Sea quick, he was late to do it whether we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would be not to our miscredit with the owners or to hurt our traffic. And the old man who had served this aim purpose would be decently grateful to us for no hindering him. This mixture of simplicity and cunning of superstition and commercial reasoning, aroused Van Helsing, who said, My friend, that devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on. When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box which had just been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we started for London. I'd seen them spear at the fellow, put out their two fingers when they saw him, to guard against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but just after, a fog closed in on us. I felt a wee bit as they did amount something. Oh, well, I wouldn't have said it was again the big box, well, on we went, and as the fog didn't he let up for five days, or just let the wind carry us, for if the devil wanted to get somewheres, well, he would fetch it up a reef. And if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way, and deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild and wanted me, right or wrong, to take out the box and fling it into the river. I had an argy with them about it with a hand spike, and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand, I had convinced them that the evil eye, or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners, were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had, mind you, taken the box on the deck, ready to fling in. And as it was marked Galatz via Varna, I thought, thought I'd let it lie till we discharged at the port, 
get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing that day. Had to remain at night by the anchor. But in the morning, broad and early, an hour before sun-up, a man came aboard with an order written to him from England to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one ready for his hand. He had his papers all right, and glad I was to be rid of that damn thing. For I was beginning myself to feel uneasy about it. If the devil did have any luggage aboard that ship, I'm thinking it was none other than that same. What was the name of the man who took it off? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and stepping down to his cabin produced a receipt signed Emmanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstrasse 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with specie we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargain he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple but important. He had received a letter from Mr Deville of London, telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise to his avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he would taken him to the ship and handed over the box so as to save porterage, and that was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbours, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before, and no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house together with the rent due in English money. This had been between 10 and 11 o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the well of the churchyard of St Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror. The women crying out, this is the work of a Slovak. We hurried away lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at a definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way by water to somewhere but where that might be, we would have to discover. With heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel, to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consider as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is a last chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of October, evening. They were so tired and worn out and dispirited, there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour, whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter, and to Mr Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done, poor dear, dear Jonathan, what he must have suffered, and what he must be suffering now. He lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit, his face is drawn with pain. Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up, with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I can only help at all. I shall do what I can. 
I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over carefully, and perhaps may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the Professor's example, and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready. I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate. And every minute is precious. Mina Harker's memorandum entered in her journal. Ground of inquiry, Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident. For had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as a man, or a wolf, or a bat, or in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference. In the state of helplessness in which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box, B. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us, by road, by rail, by water. 1. By road. There are endless difficulties, especially in leaving the city. X. There are people, and people are curious and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Why? There are, or there may be, customs and octroi officers to pass. Said his pursuers might follow, is his highest fear. And in order to prevent his being betrayed, he has repelled, so far as he can, even his victim, me. Two, by rail, there's no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal, with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night, but what would he be if left in a strange place, with no refuge that he could fly to? That is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water. Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water he is powerless except at night. Even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves. But were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land, wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was in the water, so what we have to do is ascertain what water. The first thing to realise is exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his later task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action, when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of, what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galatz and sent invoice to Varna to deceive us lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose then was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instructions sent to Emanuel Hildesheim to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Skinsky. These we must only guess at. But there must have been some letter or message since Skinsky came to Hildesheim. That so far as his plans were successful. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey. So much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition, united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him and he ran with his favouring wind through the fogs, and all until he brought up blindfold at Galatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Hildesheim cleared the box, took it off, gave it to Skinsky, 
Skensky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water, moving along. The customs and the octroi, if there have been any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the camp must have done after his arrival on land at Galatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise, the Count could appear on his own free form. Here we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the fort. And a man's remark that the murder was the work of such a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Zagani and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks who took the boxes to Varna for there they were shipped for London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange his service. When the box was on land before sunrise or after sunset, he came out from his box, met Skinsky and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up the same river. When this was done and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I've examined the map and I find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Sereth. I read in the typescript in my trance I heard cows low and water swirling level with my ears and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box then was on a river in an open boat propelled probably either by oars or poles for the banks are near it and it is working against the stream. There would be no such sound of floating downstream. Of course, it may not be either, the Sereth or the Proof, but we may possibly investigate further. Now, of these two, the Proof is the more eagerly navigated, but the Sereth is, at Fundu, joined by the Bistutsa, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop makes it manifestly as close to Dracula Castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's journal continued. When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again. And this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come by him on day or on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave his box, lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Lord Gollumin. And I? Horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the Professor, both good, but neither must go alone. There must be a force to overcome, force if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All their men smile. For amongst them, they carried a small arsenal. Said Mr. Morris, I brought some Winchesters. They're pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points, Dr. Seward said. I think I'd better go with Quincy. We've been accustomed to hunt together and we two, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art. It may be necessary to fight the Slovaks. And a chance thrust, for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, will undo our plans. There must be no chances this time. 
We shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. Of course he wanted to be with me. But then the boat service would most likely be one which would destroy the, the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence, Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all your energies may be needed at the last. It is your right to destroy him, that which has wrought such woe as to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be in my care, and if I may, I am old. My legs are not so quick as to run as once, and I am not so used to ride so along or pursue as need be, or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight in another way, and I can die if need be, as well as younger men. Now let me say that what I would is this. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank, where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country, whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream, whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin box, lest his Slovak carriers should in fear leave him to perish. We should go in the track where Jonathan went, from Bistritz over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown otherwise, after the first sunrise when we are near that fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made to sanctify, so that the nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case and tainted as she is, with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death trap? Not in the world. Never. Not for heaven's sake or hell. He became almost speechless for a minute, and then he went on. Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy, with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes, and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind, a devouring monster in embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry. Oh my God, what have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. The professor's voice, as he spoke in a clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work, to be done there, and her eyes may not see. We men here, all save Jonathan, have seen with their own eyes what is to be done before that place can be purified. Remembering that we are in terrible straits, if the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep in for a century. And then in time, my dear one, he took my hand, would come to him to keep him company. And you would be as those others that you, Jonathan, saw. You have told us of their gloating lip. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and well may it be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain, but it is necessary. My friend, is it not a dire need for the which I am giving, possibly my life? If it were that, and only one went into that piece to stay, it is I who would have to go and keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. 
Oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can woman help loving man when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And two, it made me think of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when it is properly applied? And what might it do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich, and that both he and Mr Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will in another hour. It is not three hours since it was arranged what part of each of us was to do. And now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch, with their steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr Seward and Mr Morris have a half a dozen good horses, well appointed. We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train tonight for Varesti where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have seen no one whom we can trust in the matter. The Professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me, a large ball revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas, I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dear Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say goodbye to my darling and we may never meet again. Courage, Mina, the Professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal, December the 30th, night. I'm writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He's an experienced hand at the work as he has had for years a launch of his own on the Thames and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Serith and then the Bistritza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the 47th degree north latitude would be the place chosen for the crossing country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There is plenty of water and the banks are wide enough apart to make steaming, even in the dark, easy enough. Lord Bolloming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep, how can I? There's a terrible danger hanging over my darling and her going out into that awful place. My only comfort is that we're in the hands of God. Only for that faith would it be easier to die than to live, and so be quit of all the troubles. Mr Morris and Dr Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They are to keep up the right bank, far enough off to get on higher lands, where they can see a good stretch of river and avoid following it of its curves. They have, for the first stages, two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four and all, so as to not excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which will be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles has a movable horn and can be easily adapted for Mina if required. It is a wild adventure we are on, here as we are rushing along through the darkness, with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. 
You seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways, into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Godalming is shutting the furnace door. 31st of October, still hurrying along. The day has come, and Godalming is sleeping. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, although we have heavy fur coats. As yet, we have passed only a few open boats, but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of the one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them and fell on their knees and prayed. 1st of November, evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind which we seek. We have now passed into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise, our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat, big and little. Early this morning, one crew took us for a government boat and treated us accordingly. We saw in this a way of smoothing matters. So at Fundo, when the Bistritza runs into the Serif, we got a Romanian flag which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat we have overhauled, since then this trick has succeeded. We have had every deference shown to us, and not once any objection to whatever we choose to ask to do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than the usual speed as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could not tell us whether the boat turned into the Bistritza or continued on up the Sereth. At Fundu we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I am feeling very sleepy, and cold is perhaps beginning to tell upon me, and nature must have a rest sometime. Godalming insists that I shall keep the first watch. God bless him for all his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. 2nd of November, morning. Broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seems brutally selfish for me to have slept so long, and I let him watch all night, but he was quite right. I am new man this morning. As I sit there and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary, both as to minding the engine, steering and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now in Van Helsing. I should have got to Varezzi about noon on Wednesday. It would take them some time to get the carriage and horses. So if they had started and travelled hard, they would now be at the Borgo Pass. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen. If we could only go faster, but we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down the mountains into this river, but as none of them are very large at present, at all events, though they are terrible doubtless in winter and when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have met such an obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strasbourg we may see them, for if by that time we have not overtaken the Count, it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd of November. Three days on the road, no news. And no time to write if there had been. For every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3rd of November. We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bistritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming, and if it falls heavy, it will stop us. In such a case, we must get a sledge and go on, Russian fashion. 4th of November. The day we heard of the launch having been detained by accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. The Slovak boats get up all right by the aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. 
Godalming is an amateur fitter himself, and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally, they got up the rapids all right, with local help, and are off on the chase of Brett. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tell us that after she got upon smooth water again, she kept stopping every now and again, so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal, 31st of October. Arrived at Varezzi at noon. The professor tells me that this morning, at dawn, he could hardly hypnotise me at all. And all I could say was, dark and quiet. He is off now, buying a carriage and horses. He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses, so that we may be able to change them on the way. We have something more than 70 miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting. If only we were under different conditions, how delightful it would be to see it all. If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what a pleasure it would be to stop and see people and learn something of their life and to fill our minds with memories, with all the colour and picturesqueness of the whole wild, beautiful country and the quaint people. But, alas, later, Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He's got the carriage and horses, we are to have some dinner and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. Seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any good food again. He's been shopping too. He has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be and I pray him with all the strength of my sad humble soul, that he will watch over my beloved husband to whatever may happen. Jonathan may know that I loved him and honoured him more than I can say, and that my latest and truest thought will always be for him. End of chapter 26「ジョーカーの人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の人の We have now had so many changes and find the same thing so constantly that we are encouraged to think that the journey will be an easy one. Dr. Van Helsing is laconic that he is hurrying to Bistritz and pays them well to make the exchange of horses. We get hot soup or coffee or tea and off we go. It's a lovely country full of beauties of all imaginable kinds. And the people are brave and strong and simple and seem full of nice qualities. They are very, very superstitious. In the first house where we stopped, when the woman who served us saw the scar on my forehead, she crossed herself and put out two fingers towards me to keep off the evil eye. I believe they went to the trouble of putting an extra amount of garlic into our food. Well, I can't abide garlic. Ever since then I have taken care not to take off my hat or veil, and so have escaped their suspicions. We are travelling fast, and as we have no driver with us to carry tales, we go ahead of scandal, but I dare say that the fear of the evil eye will follow hard behind us all the way. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not take any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotised me, and he says that I answered as the usual darkness lapping water and creaking wood. So our enemy is still on the river. I'm afraid to think of Jonathan. 
but somehow I have now no fear for him or for myself. I write this whilst we wait in a farmhouse for the horses to be got ready. Dr. Van Helsing is sleeping. Poor dear, he looks very tired, old and grey. But his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's. Even in his sleep he is instinct with resolution. When we have well started, I must make him rest whilst I drive. I shall tell him that we have days before us, and we must not break down when most of all his strength will be needed. All is ready, and we are off shortly. 2nd of November, morning. I was successful, and we took turns driving all night. Now the day is on us, bright though cold. There's a strange heaviness in the air. I say heaviness for want of a better word. I mean that it oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our warm furs keep us comfortable. At dawn Van Helsing hypnotised me. He says I answered darkness, creaking wood, and roaring water. So the river is changing as they ascend. I do hope that my darling will not run any chance of danger, more than need be, but we are in God's hand. 2nd of November, night. All day long driving. The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians, which at Varetsi seem so far from us and so low on the horizon, now seem to gather round us and tower in front. We both seem in good spirits. I think we make an effort each to cheer the other. In the doing so, we cheer ourselves. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Morgo Park. The houses are very few here now, and the professor says that the last horse we got will have to go on with us, as we may not be able to change. He got two in addition to the two we change, so that now we have a rude four in hand. The rear horses are patient and good. They give us no trouble. We are not worried with other travellers, and so even I can drive. We shall get to the pass in daylight. We do not want to arrive before, so we take it easy, and have each a long rest in turn. But what will tomorrow bring us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. God grant that we may be guided all right, and that he will deign to watch over my husband and those dear to us both, and who are in such deadly peril. As for me, I am not worthy of his sight. Alas, I am unclean to his eyes, and shall be until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing 4th of November This to my old and true friend, John Seward, M.D., of Purfleet, London, in case I may not see him. It may explain. It is morning, and I write by a fire, which all the night I have kept alive. Madame Mina aiding me. It is cold. Cold, so cold, that the very grey, heavy sky is full of snow, which, when it falls, will settle for all winter as the ground is hardening, to receive it. It seems to have affected Madame Mina. She has been so heavy of head all day that she was not like herself. She sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. She, who is usual so alert, have done nothing, literally nothing, all the day. She even have lost her appetite. She make no entry in her little diary, she who writes so faithful at every pause. Something whisper to me that all is not well. However, tonight she is more vif. A long sleep all day have refresh and restore her. For well, now she is all sweet and bright as ever. At sunset I try to hypnotise her, but alas, with no effect. The power has grown less and less with each day, and tonight it found me altogether. Well, God's will be done, whatever it may be, and whithersoever it may lead. Now to the historical. And for as Madame Mina write not in her stenography, 
I must, so that in my cumbrous old fashion, so that each day of us may not go unrecorded. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday morning. When I saw the signs of the dawn, I got ready for the hypnotism. We stopped our carriage and got down so that there might be no disturbance. I made a couch with furs, and Madame Mina lying down, yielded herself as usual, but more slow and more short time than ever to the hypnotic sleep. As before came the answer, darkness and the swirling of water. Then she woke, bright and radiant, and we go on our way, and soon we reach the pass. At this time and place, she become all on fire with zeal. Some new guiding power can be in her manifested, or she point to the road and say, this is the way. How know you it, I ask. Of course I know it, she answered with a pause. And have not my Jonathan travelled it and wrote it in his travel? At first I think it's somewhat strange, but I soon see that there be only one such by road. It is used but little and very different from the coach road from the Bukovina to Bistritz, which is more wide and hard and of more use. So we came down this road when we meet other ways. Not always were we sure that they were the roads at all, or they'd be neglect and light snow have fallen. The horses know, and they only. I give rein to them, and they go on so patient. By and by, we find all the strange things which Jonathan had note in that wonderful diary of him. Then we go on for long, long hours and hours. At the first, I tell Madame Mina to sleep. She try and she succeed. She sleep all the time. So at the last, I feel myself so suspicious grow and make attempt to wake her. But she sleeps on and I may not wake her though I try. I do not wish to try too hard lest I harm her, for I know that she has suffered much, and sleep at times be all in all to her. I think I drowse myself, for all of a sudden I feel guilt, as though I have done something. I find myself bolt up, with the reins in my hand, and the good horses go along, jog, jog, just as ever. I look down and find Madame Mina still asleep, it is now not far off sunset time, and over the snow the light of the sun flow in big yellow flood, so that we throw a great long shadow on where the mountain rise so steep, for we're going up and up, and all is oh so wild and rocky, as though it were the end of the world. Then I arouse Madame Mina, this time she wake up with not much trouble, then I try to put her into hypnotic sleep, but she sleep not, being as though I were not. Still I try and try, till all at once find her and myself in dark. So I look round and find that the sun has gone down. Madame Mina laughed, and I turned and looked at her. She is now quite awake, and look as well as I ever saw her since that night in Carfax, when we first entered the Count's house. I am amazed and not at ease, but she is so bright, tender and thoughtful for me, that I forget all fear. I light a fire, for we have brought a supply of wood with us, and she prepare the food while I undo the horses and set them tethered in shelter, to feed. Then, when I return to the fire, she have my supper ready. I go to help her, then she smile and tell me that she have eat already she was so hungry that she could not wait. I like it not, and I have grave doubts, but I fear to affright her. And so I am silent of it. She helped me and I eat alone. Then we wrap in fur and lie beside the fire, and I tell her to sleep while I watch. But presently I forget all of watching, when I will suddenly remember that I watch. I find her lying quiet but awake, and looking at me with so bright eyes. Once, twice more, the same occur, and I get much sleep till before morning, when I wake. I try to hypnotise her, but alas, though she shut her eyes, 
obedient, she may not sleep. The sun rise up and up, but so heavy that she will not wake. I have to lift her up and place her sleeping in the carriage where I have harnessed the horses and made all ready. Madame still asleep, and she look in her sleep more healthy, more redder than before, and I like it not, and I am afraid, afraid, afraid. I am afraid of all things, even to think, but I must go on my way. The stake we play for is life and death, or more than these, and we must not flinch. 5th of November, morning. Let me be accurate in everything. For though you and I have seen some strange things together, you may first think that I, Van Helsing, am mad, that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves has at the last turned my brain. All yesterday we travel, ever getting closer to the mountains and moving into a more and more wild and desert land. There are great flowing precipice and much falling water and nature seemed to have held some time her carnival. Madame Mina still sleep and sleep, and though I did have hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her, even for food. I began to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. Well, I said to myself, if it be that she sleep all the day, it shall also be that I do not sleep at night. As we travel along the rough road, for a road of ancient and imperfect kind there was, I held down my head and slept. Again I waked with a sense of guilt and a time passed, and found Madame Mina still sleeping, and the sun low down. But all was indeed changed. The frowning mountains seemed further away. We were near the top of a rising hill on a summit which was such a castle as Jonathan tell in his story. At once I exalted and feared, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. I woke Madame Mina and again tried to hypnotise her, but alas, unavailing, till too late. Then ere the great dark came upon us, for even after down sun the heavens reflected the golden sun on snow, and all was for the time being in a great twilight. I took out the horses and fed them in what shelter I could, and I made a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina, now awake and more charming than ever, sit comfortable and amid her rugs. I got ready food, but she would not eat, simply saying that she had not hunger. I did not press her, knowing her unavailingness, but I myself eat, for I must needs now be strong for all. Then, with a fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring so big for her comfort round where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer and broke it fine so that all was well guarded. She sat still at the time, still as one dead, and she grew whiter and even whiter till the snow was not more pale, and no word she said. But when I drew near, she clung to me, and I could know that the poor soul shook from her head to feet with a tremor that was a pain to feel. I said to her presently, when she had grown more quiet, Will you not come over to the fire? For I wished to make a test of what she could. She rose obedient, but then she have made a step, she stopped, and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She shook her head coming back sat down in her place then looking at me with great open eyes as if one wake from a sleep she said simply i cannot and remained silent i rejoiced for i knew that what she could not none of those we dreaded could though there might be danger to her body yet her soul was safe presently the horses began to scream and tore at their tethers till i came to them and quieted them when they did feel my hands on them, they whinnied low as in joy, and licked at my hands and were quiet for a time. Many times through the night did I come to them, till it arrived in the cold hour, when all nature is at lowest. Every time my coming was quiet of them, 
in the cold hour the fire began to die. I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came flying in sweeps, and with it a chill mist. Even in the dark there was a light of some kind, as there ever is over the snow, and it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments. All was in dead, grim silence, only that the horses whinnied and covered, as if in terror of the worst. I began to fear, horrible fears. But then came to me the sense of safety that the ring wherein I stood. I began to think that my imaginings were of the night, and the gloom and the unrest that I have gone through, and all the terrible anxiety. It was as though my memories of all of Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me, for the snowflakes and the mist began to wheel and circle round, till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. And then the horses cowered lower and lower, and moaned in terror as men do in pain. Even the madness of fright was not to them, so they could not break away. I feared for my dear Madame Mina when these weird figures drew near and circled round. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. When I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it, she caught me and held me back and whispered, like a voice that one hears in a dream, how low it was. No, do not go without. Here you are safe. I turned to her and, looking into her eyes, said, but you, it is for you that I fear. Whereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me. Why fear for me? Nothing safer in all the world from them as I am. And as I wondered at the meaning of her words, a puff of wind made the flame leap up, and I see the red scar on her forehead. Then at last I knew, did I not? I would have soon learned for the wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialise. If God have not taken away my reason, I saw it through my eyes. There were before me in actual flesh the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. I knew the swaying round forms, the bright hard eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy colour, and the voluptuous lips. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her, and said in those so sweet tingling tones that Jonathan said were the intolerable sweetness of the water glasses. Come, sister, come to us, come, come. In fear I turned to my poor Madame Mina, and my heart with gladness leapt like a flame. For oh, the terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story of my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked she was not, not yet, of them. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them towards the fire. They drew back before me and laughed that low, horrid laugh. I felt the fire and feared them not, for they knew that we were safe within our protections. They could not approach me while so armed. And Madame Mina, while she remained within the ring, which she could not leave, no more than they could enter. The horses had ceased to moan and lay still on the ground. The snow fell on them softly and they grew whiter. I knew that there was, for the poor beasts, no more of terror. So remain till the red of the dawn to fall through the snow gloom. I was desolate and afraid and full of woe and terror. But when that beautiful sun began to climb, the horizon of life was to me again. The first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted into the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Instinctively, with the dawn coming, 
I turned to Madame Mina, intending to hypnotise her, but she lay in a deep and sudden sleep from which I could not wake her. I tried to hypnotise her through that sleep, but she made no response. After response, none at all, and the day broke. I fear yet to stir, but I have made my fire, I have seen the horses, they are all dead. Today I have much to do here, and I keep waiting till the sun is high up, for there may be places where I must go, and where that sunlight, though snow and mist obscure it, will be to me a safety. I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will go through my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and God be thanked she is calm in her sleep. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 4th of November, evening. The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago. And by now my dear Mina would have been free. I fear to think of her off on the wolds near that horrid place. We've got horses and we follow on the track. I note this while Godalming is getting ready. We have our arms. The Sagani must look out if they mean to fight. Oh, if only Morris and Seward were there with us. We must only hope. If I write no more, goodbye, Mina. God bless and keep you. Dr Seward's Diary, 5th of November. With the dawn, we saw the body of Zagana before us, dashing away from the river with their lighter wagon. They surrounded it in a cluster and hurried along as though beset. The snow is falling lightly. There is a strange excitement in the air. It may be our own feelings, but the depression is strange. Far off I hear the howling of wolves. The snow brings them down from the mountains, and there are dangers to all of us and from all sides. The horses are nearly ready and we are soon off. We ride to the death of someone. God alone knows who, or where, or what, or when, or how. It may be... Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum 5th of November afternoon I am at least sane, thank God, for that mercy at all events, though the proving of it has been dreadful. When I left Madame Mina sleeping with the Holy Circle, I took my way to the castle. The blacksmith hammer, which I took in the carriage from the Varezzi, was useful. Although the doors were all open, I broke them off the rusty hinges, lest some ill intent or ill chance should close them, so that being entered, I might not get out. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. By memory of his diary, I found my way to the old chapel, for I knew here that my work lie. The air was oppressive. It seemed as if there was some sulphurous fume which at times made me dizzy. Either there was a roaring in my ears, or I heard afar off the howl of wolves, when I bethought me of my dear Madame Mina, and I was in terrible plight. The dilemma had me between his horns. Her I had not dare take into this place, but left safe from the vampire in that holy circle. And yet even there would be the wolf. I resolved that my work lay here, and that as to the wolves we must submit, if it were God's will. At any rate, it was only death and freedom beyond. So did I choose for her? Had it but been for myself, the choice would have been easy. The more of the wolf were better to rest in than the grave of the vampire. So I make my choice and go on with my work. I knew that there were at least three graves to find. The graves that are in habit. So I search and search and find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Oh, I doubt not that in an old time when such things were, Many a man who set forth to do such a task as mine found at the last his heart fail him, and then his nerve. So he delay and delay and delay until the mere beauty and the fascination of the wanton undead have hypnotised him, and he remain on and on until sunset come and the vampire sleep be over. 
Then the beautiful eyes of the fair woman open, look love, and the voluptuous mouth present to a kiss. And a man is weak, and there remain one more victim in the vampire fold, one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead. There is some fascination, surely, when I am moved by the mere presence of such a one. Evening lying as she lay in the tomb, fretted with age and heavy with dust of centuries, though there be that horrid odour such as the lairs of the Count have had, yes, I was moved. I, Van Helsing, with all my purpose and with my motive for hate, I was moved to a yearning for delay, which seemed to paralyse my faculties and clog my very soul. It may have been that the need of natural sleep and the strange oppression of the air were beginning to overcome me. Certain it was that I was lapsing into sleep, the open-eyed sleep of one who yields to a sweet fascination. When there came through the snow still there a long, low wail, so full of woe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion, for it was the voice of my dear Madam Mina that I heard. Then I braced myself again to my horrid task, and found, by wrenching away tomb tops, one of the other sisters, the other dark one. I dared not pause to look on her as I had on her sister, lest once more I should begin to be enthralled. But I go on searching until presently I find in a high great tomb, as if made to one much beloved, that other fair sister, which like Jonathan had seen to gather herself out of the atoms of the mist. She was so fair to look on, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely voluptuous, that the very instinct of man in me, which calls for some of my sex to love and to protect one of hers, made my head whirl with new emotion. But God be thanked that sole wail of my dear Madam Mina had not died out in my ears, and before the spell could be wrought further upon me, I nerved myself to my wild work. By this time I had searched all the tombs in the chapel. So far as I could tell, there had been only three of these undead phantoms around us in the night. I took it that there were no more of active undead existent. There was one great tomb, more lordly than all the rest. Huge it was, and nobly proportioned. On it was but one word. Dracula. This, then, was the undead name of the King Vampire, to whom so many more were due. Its emptiness spoke eloquent, to make certain what I knew. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves, through my awful work, I laid in Dracula's tomb some of the wafer, and so banished him from the undead forever. Then began my terrible task. I dreaded it. Had it been but one, had it been easy, comparative but three. To begin twice more after I'd been through the deed of horror, for if it was terrible with this sweet Miss Lucy, what would it not be with these strange ones who had survived through centuries and who had been strengthened by the passing of years, who would, if they could, have fought for their foul lives? Oh, my friend John, but it was butcher work. I had not been nerved by thoughts of other dead, and now of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear. I could not have gone on, I tremble and tremble even yet, though till it was all over, God be thanked, my nerve did stand. Had I not seen the repose in the first place, and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final dissolution came, as realisation that the soul had been one, I could not have gone further with my butchery, could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home, the plunging of writhing form and lips of bloody foam. I should have fled in terror and left my work undone. But it is over, and the poor souls, I can pity them now, and weep as I think of them placid, each in her full sleep of death, for a short moment ere fading. For friend John hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body began to melt away and crumble into its native dust, 
as though the death that should have come centuries agone had at last assert himself and say at once and loud, I am here. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. When I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke from her sleep and seeing me, cried out in pain that I had endured too much. Come, she said, come away from this awful place. Let us go and meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us. She was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervour. I was glad to see her paleness and her illness, for my mind was full of the fresh horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. And so with trust and hope, and yet full of fear, we go eastward to meet our friends, and him whom Madame Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Journal 6th of November. It was late in the afternoon when the Professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We did not go fast, though the way was steeply downhill, for we had to take heavy rugs and wraps with us. We dared not face the possibility of being left without warmth in the cold and the snow. We had to take some of our provisions too, for we were in a perfect desolation. And so far as we could see, through the snowfall, that there was not even a sign of habitation. When we had gone about a mile, I was tired with the heavy walking and sat down to rest. Then we looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky, for we were so deep under the hill whereupon it was set that the angle of perspective of the Carpathian Mountains was far below it. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice, and with seemingly a great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on any side. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. They were far off, but the sound, even though coming muffled through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. I knew that from the way that Dr. Van Helsing was searching about that he was trying to seek some strategic point where we would be less exposed in case of attack. The rough roadway still led downwards. We could trace it through the drifted snow. In a little while the professor signalled to me, so I got up and joined him. He would found a wonderful spot, sort of a natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He took me by the hand and drew me in. See, he said, here you will be in shelter. And if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one. He brought out our furs and made a snug nest for me, and got out some provisions and forced them upon me. But I could not eat. To even try to do so was repulsive to me. And as much as I would have liked to please him, I could not bring myself to the attempt. He looked very sad, but did not reproach me. Taking his field glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock, and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, Look, Madame Mina, look, look. I sprang up and stood beside him on the rock. He handed me his glasses and pointed. The snow was now falling more heavily and swirled about fiercely, for a high wind was beginning to blow. However, there were times when there were pauses between the snow flurries, and I could see a long way round. From the height where we were at, it was possible to see a great distance and far off, beyond the waste of snow, I could see the river lying like a black ribbon in kinks and curls as it wound its way straight in front of us and not far off, in fact so near that I wondered we had not noticed it before. Came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart, a long lighter wagon, which swept from side to side like a dog's tail wagging. With each stern inequality of the road outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leapt as I saw it, for I felt that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing which was still then imprisoned there 
would take new freedom and could in any of many forms elude all pursuit in fear i turned to the professor to my consternation however he was not there an instant later i saw him below me round the rock he had drawn a circle such as we had found shelter in the last night when he had completed it he stood beside me again saying at least you shall be safe here from him he took the glasses from me and at the next lull of the snow swept the whole space below us see he said they come quickly they are flogging the horses and galloping as hard as they can he paused and went on in a hollow voice they are racing for the sunset you may be too late god's will be done down came another blinding rush of driving snow and the whole landscape was blotted out it soon passed however and once more his glasses were fixed on the plain then came a sudden cry look 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 see two horsemen follow fast coming up from the south it must be quincy and john take the glasses look before the snow blots it all out i took it and looked the two men might be dr seward and dr morris i knew at all events neither of them was jonathan at the same time i knew that jonathan was not far off looking around i saw on the north side of the coming party two other men riding at breakneck speed one of them of course i knew was jonathan and the other i took of course to be lord godalming they too were pursuing the party with the car when i told the professor he shouted in glee like a schoolboy and after looking intently till the snowfall made sight impossible he laid his Winchester rifle, ready for use, against the boulder at the opening of our shelter. They're all converging, he said. When the time comes, we shall have gypsies on all sides. I got out my revolver ready to hand, for whilst we were speaking, the howling of wolves came louder and closer. When the snowstorm abated a moment, we looked again. It was strange to see the snow falling in such heavy flakes close to us and beyond the sun shining more and more brightly as it sank down towards the far mountain tops sweeping the glass all round us i could see here and there dots moving singly and in twos and threes and larger numbers the wolves were gathering for their prey every instant seemed an age whilst we waited the wind came now in fierce bursts and the snow was driven with fury as it swept upon us in circling eddies at times we could not see an arm's length before us but at others as a hollow sounding wind swept by us it seemed to clear the air space around us so that we could see afar off we had of late been so accustomed to watch for sunrise and sunset that we knew with fair accuracy when it would be and we knew that before long the sun would set it was hard to believe that by our watches it was less than an hour that we had waited in that rocky shelter before the various bodies began to converge close upon us the wind came now with a fiercer and more bitter sweeps and more steadily from the north it seemingly had driven the snow clouds from us for with only occasional bursts the snow fell we could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party the pursued and the pursuers strangely enough those pursued did not seem to realize or at least to care that they were pursued they seemed however to hasten with redoubled speed as the sun dropped lower and lower on the mountain tops closer and closer they drew the professor and i crouched down behind our rock and held our weapons ready i could see that he was determined that they should not pass one and all were quite unaware of our presence all at once two voices shouted out halt one was my jonathan's raised in a high key of passion the other mr morris's strong resolute tone of quiet command the gypsies may not have known the language but there was no mistaking the tone in whatever tongue the words were spoken instinctively they reined in and at the instant lord godalming and jonathan dashed up at one side and dr seward and mr morris on the other the leader of the gypsies a splendid looking fellow who sat in his horse 
like a senator, waved them back and in a fierce voice gave to his companions some word to proceed. They lashed the horses which sprang forward, but the four men raised their Winchester rifles and in an unmistakable way commanded them to stop. At the same moment Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins, which drew up. The leader turned to them and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. Issue was joined in an instant. The leader, with a quick movement of his rein, threw his horse out in front, and pointing first to the sun, now close down on the hilltops, and then to the castle, said something which I did not understand. For answer, all four men of our party threw themselves from their horses and dashed towards the cart. I should have felt terrible fear at seeing Jonathan in such danger, but that the ardour of battle must have been upon me, as well as the rest of them. I felt no fear, but only a wild surging desire to do something. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command his men instantly formed around the cart in a sort of undisciplined endeavour, each one shouldering and pushing the other in his eagerness to carry out the order. In the midst of this I could see that Jonathan was on one side of the ring of men and Quincy on the other, were forcing away to the cart. It was evident that they were being bent on finishing their task before the sun should set. Nothing seemed to stop or even hinder them. Neither the levelled weapons nor the flashing knives of the gypsies in front, nor the howling of the wolves behind appeared to even attract their attention. Jonathan's impetuosity and the manifest singleness of his purpose seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped upon the cart and with a strength which seemed incredible raised the great box and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime, Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring of Zigani. All the time I had been breathlessly watching Jonathan, I had, with the tail of my eye, seen him pressing desperately forwards and seen the knives of the gypsies flash as he won away through them, and they cut him. He had parried with his great bowie knife at first, I thought, that he too had come through in safety. But as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side, and that the blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan with desperate energy attacked one end of the chest, attempting to prise off the lid with his great cookery knife, he attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Under the efforts of both men, the lid began to yield. The nails drew with a quick screeching sound and the top of the box was thrown back. By this time, the gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters, at the mercy of Lord Godalming and Dr. Seward, had given in and made no resistance. The sun was almost down on the mountain tops, and the shadows of the whole group fell long upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with a horrible vindictive look, which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, well, at the same moment, Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I should be glad as long as I live, and even in that moment of final dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace, such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sky, and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. The gypsies, taking us in some way the cause of the extraordinary disappearance of the dead man, 
turned without a word and rode away as if for their lives. Those who were unmounted jumped upon the lighter wagon and shouted to the horsemen not to desert them. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow, holding his hand pressed to his side. The blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him, for the holy circle did not now keep me back. So did the two doctors. Jonathan knelt behind him, and the wounded man lay back his head on his shoulder. With a sigh, he took with a feeble effort my hand in that of his own, which was unstained. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in my face, and he smiled at me and said, I'm only too happy to have been of service. Oh, God! He cried suddenly, struggling into a sitting posture, and pointing to me, It was worth it for this to die. Look, look. The sun was now righter down upon the mountain top, and with red gleams fell upon my face, so that it was bathed in rosy light. With one impulse the men sank to their knees, and a deep earnest amen broke for all, as their eyes followed the pointing finger. The dying man spoke. Now God be thanked, that this has not been in vain. See the snow is not more stainless than her forehead curse has passed away and to our bitter grief with a smile and silence he died a gallant gentleman note seven years ago we all went through the flames and the happiness of some of us since then is we think well worth the pain we endured in an added joy to Mina and to me that our boy's birthday is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died his mother holds, I know, the secret belief that some of our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. His bundle of names like all our little band of men together, but we call him Quincy. In the summer of this year, we made a journey to Transylvania and went over the old ground which was and is to us so full of vivid and terrible memories. It was almost impossible to believe that the things of which we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths. Every trace of all that had been was blotted out. The castle stood as before, reared high above a waste of desolation. When we got home we were talking of the old time which we could all look back on without despair, for Godalming and Seward were both happily married. I took the papers from the safe where they had been ever since our return so long ago. We were struck with the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed, there is hardly one authentic document, nothing but a mass of typewriting, except the later books of Mina and Seward and myself, and Van Helsing's memorandum. We could hardly ask anyone, even if we did wish to, to accept these as proofs of so wild a story. Van Helsing summed it all up as he said, with our boy on his knee, We want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. The boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on he will understand how some men so loved her that they dare much for her sake. Jonathan Harker End of chapter 27 End of Dracula Recorded by Peter Keeble, Nottingham United Kingdom.